absolutely. Go ahead. Yeah. So this is Noah, and here's this picture. I didn't bring him on this trip. We do have five other kids, um, and so it gets to be a little more difficult. Thank you. It gets to be a little difficult hauling all five of those from Birmingham, Alabama, to here, and um, and so I just came um, for this trip. And so he was diagnosed in 2019, um, and he was born in 7-7-2014. So today I'm just going to kind of run through. I'm going to give you a little all about Noah, just to kind of tell you where he's at, um, and then tell you a little bit about what he does for self-injury. And then I asked a question on the BRS Facebook page um, just for people to you know, that wanted to respond to kind of give us an idea of how old their child is and what problems they're dealing with, um, just to get a little more variety so that you see other people, what they're going through, so. So Noah, um, I did not know there was anything wrong until right after he was born. He has um, a topic craniosynostosis, so he had that ridge and a lot of BRS, kids do have that and so he did have to have surgery at three months old to get all that fixed then he wore a helmet for two years um, which was really cute but it was very um, traumatizing for our whole family um, but um, but we're finally done with that which is wonderful um, he was always failure to thrive so he was born in a normal birth weight but he just had a hard time um, sustaining that and keeping it going up he kind of stayed steady for a long time. I think we rejoiced today. I think like we were trying to get to 17 pounds for like, I don't know, two years and he finally made it and we had like a big old party because he had made it. Um, but he's doing well now with his weight actually. Um, he finally can walk. It took us a, took a lot of physical therapy, but he's walking. Um, now he's not very steady. So things like stairs, um, we always make sure that we walk with him up and down the stairs because at any moment he just will just, I don't know, fall. <laughs> I don't know. Um, some days he's really steady, some days he's not. You know, sometimes he's just a little off balance. And then some days he's great, you know. Um, he loves to dance, so he likes to do his, his moves. He, he's got moves. Um, that are pretty pretty crazy and fun, but um, he likes to dance a lot, loves music. He's nonverbal, but he loves to sing. He likes to just grab a microphone and just take over. So um, I sing a lot like at church, and so he comes to practice with me, and so that's a picture of him. He stole my microphone and went to town in front of everybody. So um, he loves to sing, loves music, he loves um, action heroes. He Spider-Man is his hero. Um, Minions, Power Rangers, anything with a lot of action, he loves that. Um, feeding is good. It kind of goes up and down, and it really is based on whether he's constipated or not. So he, is, he deals a lot with constipation. Um, and so when he's good in that area, he eats really good. He eats soft foods. He does have trouble with like meat and tougher um consistencies like that he has a hard time chewing it he'll usually chew it for a little bit and then he'll spit it out or he'll pull it out of his mouth and stick it in his hair you know make it moose it all up with like meat and stuff which is lovely um so he does that it can be entertaining um he is a librarian's worst nightmare <laughs> He loves to tear books apart. I mean, like, my poor daughter loves to read, and we had so many books, and uh, he just wiped us all out of those. So he, he loves tearing, he loves books, and he loves reading them, but something will just click in him, and then just, I mean, it's almost like I can't, it's, I mean, he'll just, like, just start ripping on them. Stop! Um, and then he tries to eat the paper, so I don't know if that's a portion of self-injury, but he likes to eat paper, construction paper, it's, I mean, cardboard, it's really, really crazy. Um, I'm constantly trying to get that stuff out of his mouth. Not only that, he makes really good spit wads with it, so there's just, he'll throw it, it's just a mess sometimes, so he's a big mess. <laughs> 
Um, Noah loves to go to school. Um, we have to have a transition for him though to get to school. If I, we live five minutes from his school, but if I drove him and took him into school, he wouldn't stay. He would, he would start crying and whining and, um, but the school bus is our transition. So it's, I mean, he literally gets on the bus and less than five minutes he's off the bus, but, um, that's his transition. So when the school bus comes, he loves getting on the school bus. And then he just walks in there and that kind of gets his day started. So that's a good routine for him. And it puts him in the mindset, hey, I'm going to school. And at the school bus that during COVID, we had meltdowns because the school, he, he was looking for the school bus and it, you know. Um, so that was very difficult when we were in our COVID mode. But um, he loves the school bus. That was actually a pajama day, so that's why he's weird um, and then there's our family down there so you know he's kind of right in the middle um, he's actually a rainbow baby so I lost the baby right before him um, but he's number three in the lineup and let's see what else is on here yeah and so that's kind of a glimpse of Noah he is just our treasure you know, so he's our one in a million child. You know, uh, we get the jackpot with him. A lot of people are like, how do you deal with a child like that? And I'm like, I mean, he's God's gift to us. I mean, we love him and we've just embraced who he is. And we're trying to make, you know, life better where we can for him. But he is just a joy to be around. He does have issues sometimes, but for the most part, I mean, he's a very happy kid. And, um, loves life and we love him he loves passies we still have passies but he gets to drop it when other people come over and hide it but um anyways so self-injury so i was talking before during our break and really when he was younger maybe around five years old he was kind of a holy terror um behavioral wise he i mean it was um it was kind of crazy with him. You would never know what he was going to do. He was very physical. He would pull my hair, pull his hair. I mean, to the, I mean, he pulled chunks out, not just like pull a little bit. It was hurt me and pull my hair. And it'd come out of nowhere. So, it, you know, it's terrible. Um, he would bite me to the point of blood. You know, I'm thinking I might need stitches. <laughs> You know, he pinched me, and it wasn't just me, so it was everybody he was around. So our difficulty came with the siblings, you know, um, him pulling my daughter's hair, you know, pinching the kids, biting them. So that was a difficult age for us. Um, we actually brought him to the Michigan meeting that we had in 2019, and we were here for literally like five minutes. We came in the conference room. And he ran, and um, there was glasses like those. Um, they were like wine glasses, and they had stacked them up. And he pulled the one up, and before I could get over there, he pulled them, and they came like crashing down, broke everyone. I went, oh, Lord. So that's about how our days go when we get somewhere. Um, just an example. Um, and so it was kind of a difficult time. But I will tell you, now he's eight years old, and he's kind of, you know, He's kind of calmed down a lot. So I don't know if that's because his communication is a little better than it was then. I don't know if I've learned how to deal with him better. Um, I don't know what it is that has made him calmer. Maybe just his age, you know, just he's finally calming down a little bit. Um, I don't know what it was. But one thing he does still do, um, which is pretty bad, um, and my husband actually caught him he sent me that picture. I, I was trying to catch it on video so I could show y'all because those are just things when he's doing it, I'm trying to make him stop it rather than take a video of it. So I don't really have a lot of videos of him doing these things and I'm gonna try to keep up with that. Next time I'm gonna try to get some videos. But um, I was actually singing in the choir, practicing and um, they were sitting, you know, really far away from other people because we still have to be mindful of the hair pulling. If someone sits in front of him, he's gonna, I mean, he'll grab their hair and pull it out. So um, he still has that urge. He just doesn't do it as bad anymore. But he just bites the stew out of his hand. I mean, like, to the point to where it bleeds. I mean, I, you know, it's, 
he scarred it over. It's this area. I don't know why he bites that area, um, but he does. I've covered it. So what have I done as a solution? I've tried to cover it. I've wrapped Coban around it. I've done ace bandage type things just to kind of maybe prevent them from actually getting to the skin. You know, and he doesn't work. He'll either go to the other side or he does everything he can to get it off so that he can bite it. And I don't know what that urge is, but I do know when it happens, it's usually triggered out of frustration. So he's usually frustrated that he's not getting what he wants. Maybe his iPad died and it's not turning on anymore. Maybe the internet disconnected and so he can't watch his video he's wanting to watch. Or maybe he's wanting to do play something and he can't do it. You know, maybe he's in, like in this situation, we have a fairly big church and there's a lot of people and so, you know, sometimes when there's big crowds, he just gets overwhelmed with things and I, he'll just start biting and biting. Um, and so, the best thing I do is I don't get, I don't ever get upset with him. I, um, I just gently try to get his, you know, get his hand from his mouth and I'll just kind of love on him. And then I take him to a different situation. So I take him out of the environment he's in. You know, it may be a room, maybe we go outside for just a little bit. It's kind of just a quick distraction for him. And then he'll just quit. Um, so if he's, just gnawing at that hand and biting and biting and he won't stop. You know, I just completely change environments for him. Um, if we're at church, we always take two cars, for example. Um, so my husband drives one, I drive one. So that if Noah gets overwhelmed and just needs to go home, you know, one of us will drive him home. And then the other will stay with the other kids or finish whatever we're doing. We do that at like birthday parties, family events. Anything we go to, we now we take two cars because um, if he was an only child, that might be different. But I do have other children, and I don't want it, you know them to have to leave every time they was you know having an issue. So, um, and usually there's no point in us staying. So we've tried. Let's just stay and see what happens. If he gets better, doesn't work. If he's having a bad day, you know, biting his hand, it's just it's time to go. So. We change the situation and the environment, and that usually helps us. So, so here is um, that's kind of what we're dealing with right now is the hand body. And so you may want to look at the BRS Facebook page, and, and there's some more details that parents picked or that they put down, um, and you can you can read them all. Maybe they'll help you because um, I kind of wanted to see what other parents um, were dealing with. And I got a lot back that they were biting their hands. So I don't know if that's something that just they do. I, I don't know. But I did get a lot of hand biting. Um, I had, let's see, everyone from six years old to I think 27 was the oldest who responded. And we got hand biting, slap side of the head, Ben's pinkies back. Noah has done that. He's bent his pinkies back. Um, fingers back and odd shakes and it just makes me, you know, just whoo, um, makes it hurt just looking at it. But um, they pull hair, um, throws head backer against the wall or a seat when not feeling well, squeezes their chin, eats clothes, sleeves, emblems, zippers, Noah eats paper. <laughs> um, let's see. Bites, hands, arms, knees, um, and a lot of these causes, it, the parents seem to think that it's really frustration, anxiety, maybe they're having GI issues, um, they're angry maybe, um, and so, you know, I think it just, I think it's, for me, it's really based on his communication, lack of being able to communicate, and he's just really frustrated, maybe he's not getting what he wants. Um, and it sounds like that's the case for a lot of these parents, too, who commented. Um, they also, how did they solve their problem? Um, they gave them something to chew on. For Noah, that's a pacifier. Um, so I've tried that, too, and that helps a little bit. Um, using a calm, gentle voice. Um, what else did they put? 
aromatherapy, I thought that was kind of a different one I've never tried. So aromatherapy, music, um, try to redirect. And so this might be something you want to go back. I did have a parent have a comment, and I even put the quote up here. They said, the more she was able to express herself, the less we saw the behavior. So maybe the better they are with communicating, maybe you'll see a decrease in this type of behavior. You know, so there is hope. Um, so this has been my experience with self-injury. And so now I'm gonna turn it over. Yeah, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. So happy, and you can either come up here or I can bring you the mic over there. Let's see over here. Okay. You will see me over there. And if you need me to switch the slide, you have another slide. I still, oh, that's fine. Um, I'm not a public speaker. Didn't have any slides made up, sorry. Um, our experience with Stephanie is a little different in that Stephanie didn't join our family until she was two. Um, and at that point, she had been horribly neglected. Pretty much ignored for the first two years of her life. Um, so when we got her, all she did was lay on the ground, completely arched backwards with her feet touching her head. Uh, and getting her out of that position was difficult. Um, between that and just throwing up, it's pretty much her existence. Um, when uh, we finally got her accustomed to being touched, being taken care of, um, she started to uh, respond better, started to relax she would have some pretty massive meltdowns where she would just literally slam her head into the ground. Um, so we opted to pad our living room floor. Um, we went out and bought some padding, um, the mats, kids' mats, put them underneath our rugs, um, just to soften the blow when she did that. Um, we still have to keep her away from furniture and stuff because she would roll a little bit and slam her head into the, the, the TV stands and stuff. Um, over the years, she's gone back and forth where she'd be for a while and then other times that she would have massive meltdowns again. Our biggest help um, has been getting her involved in ABA therapy and it has taken us three therapists to find the right one um, and we found the right one about six months ago or so and she is an absolute godsend. Um, I thought she would overwhelm Stephanie because she's a talker and she talks non-stop um, and Stephanie can get overwhelmed much things going on, so we thought, oh, this is not going to be a good fit. She's going to overwhelm her. But Stephanie loves her, and she thrives on it, and she can get Stephanie to do things that we have never been able to get her to do. Um, so she's now got her sitting up for up to a half hour by herself. Um, she's got her taking more steps in her walker, but more importantly, she's got her to quit biting herself as badly as she used to. She would literally have bite marks up and down her arms. You know, we take pictures of them because people were always wondering where the bite marks came from. Um, or that they were bite marks when they started to heal because she'd leave bruises up and down her arm. Um, she still will occasionally bite herself and she'll grab a hold and not want to let go unless so you're trying to fry her mouth, uh, freeze, or just let go of her skin. But it's not nearly what it used to be. Um, and I do give all the credit to the ABA people. Um, she did recently end up in the emergency room because she bit herself so hard that it got infected. We wish she could understand that she caused it herself, but she doesn't. Um, so we just keep working on it. When she is one, in one of her biting moods, we try the, uh, our hospital calls them no-nos, I'm not sure what everybody else calls them, um, the hard boards they put on their arms for when they're having IVs and stuff. Um, so we use those on her when she's having a really rough time just to keep from hurting herself. We've tried to Teflon sleeves. She figured out how to pull those off. Um, they're currently working on chew toys with her. She normally wears, I put them out on my bed to pack and I walked out without them. She normally wears a teething necklace um, and they're trying to teach her when she gets upset to put that in her mouth instead of her hands. Um, she's getting there. It's a slow process, but she's getting there. Um, either she's tolerating noises better now than she used to tolerate noises. She's done remarkably well here. I was a little concerned how she'd do. I was concerned about how she'd do on the flight. I had a couple biting instances on the fight, fight here, uh, but nothing major. We were able to get her to stop after the first few bites. Um, uh, the other thing that we found that helps her is when she gets upset, we had gotten a Rottweiler. Uh, it was totally my dog. That's the only reason we got him. Um, we 
had no intentions of being anything but. She fell in love with him, he fell in love with her, um, and he will see it, but she's upset, and he goes and lays next to her, and she starts petting him, and she calms down. Um, so he has been wonderful for her. Um, to see this, you know, 100-pound Rottweiler laying next to her, and if she stops petting him, he puts his paw gently on her, and he her to start petting him again. Um, so it's helped with the behaviors, it's helped with her sensory issues, because she's never liked to use her hands for anything. Self-interest behaviors are basically biting and the slamming her head. And then she does the, probably you've seen her walking around the hall, she throws herself pretty badly side to side. Um, so we run into watching the door frames. When you go through the door frames, because she'll throw herself into a door frame. Um, or you're carrying her, she will get upset and she will arch herself severely again. So she, you're trying to carry this kid that's bent over backwards. Um, and she will bite you if you're not careful. Um, but she'll also bite you when she thinks it's funny. You're carrying her and she thinks, oh, let me bite you. you know? um, it's quite hilarious when you're trying to carry him. You're going like this, don't bite me, don't bite me. <laughs> if you're carrying her down the hall. Um, so um, I don't know how much of Stephanie's behaviors are related to the syndrome, how much of them are related to the severe neglect, how much of the combination of both. Uh, I would have loved to have had those two years for her to see what type of child she'd be today if she had had the care that so many of your kids are getting those first two years of their life. If she would be a totally different child, if she'd be in a, still have boss, but be more developmentally on target, you know, farther along on target, not so sensitive. Um, I, I don't know. She has been diagnosed with autism, secondary to, to the bowing. Um, so we deal with that. Um, and in Oregon, the only way you can get ADA therapy is if they are diagnosed. She has been out of school since COVID hit, uh, only because our school district required masks up until March of this year, and they didn't make exceptions unless you wanted to isolate them in a room by themselves, which defeated the purpose of sending her back to school. So we've opted to keep her home. But the flip side of that is we've been able to increase her ADA therapy to seven hours a day, uh, and I think she's doing much better at home than she would have been at school. Uh, so we're a little hesitant to send her back to school in September, but I also want her to get some social. Uh, so we'll see in the state of her behavior. Um, we were able to um, work with the last, when well, we did the puberty session last, uh, we had been noticing a uh, difference in her behaviors uh, during the month where she would just have horrible periods. And we started documenting when she was having those. And it coincided with when her sisters were having their cycle. So we realized after almost a year of watching these behaviors that she was cycling with her sisters even before she actually started. So when she started the same way her sisters started, it's like, okay. Um, so she is definitely hormonal before her cycle. Definitely get the attitude from her before her cycle. Um, behaviors pick up, but we also know that that's related to her cycle. We just have to figure out where we're gonna go from that. she was born, but she's been with us since she was born. She was born, we picked her up in the hospital, I met her there on day two, so we've been with her the whole time. And um, for us, the self-injury kind of took a different um, development and kind of saw it come on differently. So I wanted to address that just a little bit for um, those who might have a different path moving forward and see um, where it might pick up and where things might need attention before it gets catastrophic. Um, about uh, Sam was born in 2010, um, she had uh, Down syndrome as well, which is something that's kind of different. As far as I know, she's the only one um, dealing with both um, genetic conditions of that magnitude, um, which we did know at birth, and we did not have a diagnosis for a bone with it until um, 2018 or 19. Around 2014, she was three or four years old. She started walking around. We started noticing um, really abnormal pain tolerance levels. 
Um, this picture is one that I chose. Her thumb is all purple. She had closed her thumb into a drawer, and she was walking, loved to be walking. And I remembered one morning I called her name, and she usually responds and would follow into me. And um, I have another child two years behind her. And so I was calling them, and one child came and scammed in. And so I called again. She wouldn't come. She wouldn't come. I didn't think much about it. I thought maybe she's not interested. I kept going about the day with the toddler um, for maybe three or four minutes. Um, eventually, I went in the kitchen to see why Sammy wasn't coming, and she had accidentally closed her thumb into a drawer. And she ended up losing the thumb. It was stuck in there. It was, it was awful. It had to have been painful. And she just stood there, and she did nothing. She never reacted. She never did react. The thumb fell off. She never reacted. You know, she would grab a hot pan when we weren't looking in the kitchen, and we wouldn't know if he weren't looking at her because she would not react to pain um, the correct way. Um, along that time, around that time, we also started seeing a little more um, what we call seeking behavior, where she's kind of looking for impact, almost like she wants to feel something. So we saw her head banging. We saw things um, kind of crop up that we hadn't seen before, even though she was able to do these um, movements capable physically. We didn't see them until um, she was three or four years old. Um, this is actually a video that we started noticing. It wasn't until I went back and started preparing my thoughts for on the onset and development of Samantha's injuries behavior, particularly that I kind of, kind of noticed that some of her big time um, self-injury behaviors started with really small abnormal movements and they kind of intensified over time. I didn't really notice it until I went back and looked and I thought, oh, She's doing that. That became a really big problem later. So I'm just going to let this one play and I'll kind of talk through it if it will play. Maybe it's not playing? There's a. You see it, actually? Did you get that? This is the one, yeah. Let's see if it's. Amanda, do you know how to get it to play? I don't see a play button. on the couch playing with her sister, a very normal, typical day. Um, if you notice, um, her hand comes here. And so she did this a lot. And we see that a lot. It's kind of like an autistic swimming behavior. And it got that got it and turned into biting here at the same place. Very similar to the biting there. We kind of saw that coming. And she comes over here. She's giving her sister kisses. Of course, she's kind of clumsy and has really hard movements, which she doesn't need to do with self-injury. Nice kisses. Nice kisses. As I'm telling her to be nice, she's responding. You notice here she has really good response time. As we saw self-injury increase, I noticed her cognition decreasing. So as um, she became less responsive to us saying, I could not do this to her now. If she was having an interaction with she her sister now, I told her to change her behavior, she would not. There's very few things that she does and understands and changes. So her cognition was going down oh, as her self-injury was going up. After this one, if you watch her, um, she has a little, what we call a hair pull. So she just kind of flicks her hair and she just grabs it. And it's really short and it's not effective at first. Let's see if I can see it in just a moment. And um, as she got a little bit older, we started seeing this hair flick more and more. And it was right here on the side. Did yeah. you see the hair flick? Not, nothing to think of, right? She just flicked her hair. It's not a big deal. Eventually, she was bloody on both sides from here to here. There was no hair. She had pulled, 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 pulled. And I didn't realize that she had woken up and she was bloody. I thought, what in the world's going on? Did she rupture her eardrums? You know, I thought something had happened in her sleep. And it was that, and she had done it, and she did it in her sleep, and she pulled and pulled and pulled, and she was bloody from here. And we had no idea. And that was one of the first um, really big, intense um, things that we saw with self-injury. Um, and over the years, it became more intense, and it became more intentional. Um, let me go this path. That's okay, we can leave right there, so it's just fine. So, um, when we saw the onset, of course, first thing we're thinking, this can't keep going, we have to change this, we have to have some sort of intervention. So we went with all the um, therapists that we had, she was receiving ABA, OT, PT, and speech. At this point, she was receiving them all in home, which was helpful because they all could coordinate together, and everything that she did was very functional for her life. So they did give us some um, like redirect strategies, and so a lot of them were functional for a while. This is after her hair kind of grew back. Um, we learned she could do this. So you can see she's mad at her sister. Her sister took the phone from her. They're dancing with music. She tried to take it back. Sister's too fast. She can't get the phone back. And so instead of going to get it, she sits there and bangs her head. And that's how she kind of tells us that she's frustrated. And we had developed this little, this is a really soft chair. And this was a redirect because she would do this anywhere. She would do it on the corner. She would do it on the table. She would do it wherever she could find. And she would just hit her face when she was frustrated. 
And we saw this coordination here, uh, or the correlation between her being angry and not getting what she wanted and these self-angry behaviors. So we tried redirect and gave her some other um, things to kind of work with that. A couple years later, um, about seven years old, she had an unexplained head injury. I still, we don't know what happens. A lot of the doctors, the ER doctors, um, trauma people says no, it wasn't an accident, it wasn't self-injury. And then the neuro people say no, it had to have been trauma or self -injury. No one knows what happened. She had lots of head swelling. Um, and this is where we went from occasional attitude type, what I call behavioral self-injury, to pervasive um, self-injury, where she would not stop. She was incapable of stopping. She would punch her face, she would pull her eyes, she would pull her hair, and she could not stop. If she was not being physically restrained, she could not stop. And so that was really hard for us. Um, let's see, some of the things that came up after that, she had the hair pulling already, um, the punching became very pointed and very much directed at her head, slamming and head banging against objects, corners, things like that. And this the first time we saw boxing of the ears, so where she's hitting really hard um, directly on her ears. Um, and the scratching and biting intensified as well. So um, just an example here, you can see what her hair, she changed, when she got a little bit older, she had more um, grip, so we had it so that she couldn't reach this part that she had pulled in before, and we did not realize she had started to pull on the top. So she would get it, we had a cute little hairstyle where we keep everything out of her reach so she couldn't pull her hair, but she figured how she'd get her hands in and twist it around and she would pull it, and we'd find hair balls on the floor, like, look like someone cleaned out a brush um, that she had pulled out with her hands, um, and continued. We didn't have a reason or an explanation for why these were changing and why they were getting worse. Uh, around 2020, we started working with a child psychiatrist, and she says, I want to see these behaviors. Of course, it's COVID, so we can't bring her to the office. So we started making some of um, the videos that kind of explain, as we're looking, what the pervasive means. So you can see on the floor there, her nose, she knows how to take them yeah. off. Now he illustrates. She takes them off, and it's this. And it's going and going and going. And this is um, actually mild compared to what we saw in the beginning of the pervasive self injury behaviors. Um, this is obviously she's not being restrained in any fashion at this point, so, and she's still taking breaks from her insomnia. And um, because I'm taping it, I would not have taped it if she was actually really hurting herself. So this is not as intense as it was at the time. And of course, you can't be with your kid 24 hours a day, you can't have hands on all the time. So things like transitions. This is picking up from school. She has a hard time sometimes with trenches and sometimes not, but um, you can see the no-notes here are completely worn out and insurance hasn't replaced them yet, so we're, they weren't the most effective and she was able to punch even with her um, no-notes on while we were waiting to get some new ones in this particular video. Okay, so that being said, I'd love to tell you she's all better now, we're done with this, and I'm an expert on telling you here's what to do to solve the problem. I don't have that for you. I have tried lots and lots of things. I have been able to keep her safe through different ideas um, over the years. Some of the ones that I haven't heard mentioned here before, um, bracelets, I don't know if you guys ever know what paracord bracelets are, but a lot of times like at girls camp or whatever, um, little girls or people will braid like a paracord strip into a bracelet. And um, they're really, they're wide and they're soft. And we put them on Samantha before and we've been able to keep her so that her hands are by her hips or her hands are in her car seat, sometime when we cannot hold the hands on her. So if I'm the only adult with her and we're driving, I might use those attached to her car seat to keep her from being able to access her face. Uh, we have, we call this a Sammy shield. Here in the picture, it's actually a dog cone, kind of like a cone of shame. We got it from just a pet store, you can get different sizes, and we flip it upside down. We make sure some of them have like scents in them for the dogs to calm them down. We don't need that. And I would always use a clear one but you turn it upside down and you put it over her shoulders and it kind of sits there when it's the right side. It just sits on her shoulders and she's able to use her hands and when she tries to get to her face, she can't. This is one of my favorite um, little side note tools, I guess, to use because it does not restrict the use of her arms. So no-nos are very effective when they fit appropriately, but then her arms are like this. So she can, it's very hard for her to play with toys it's hard for her to pat a cake, it's hard for her to pick things up and be successful at these tasks that I would like her to do and to, to be functional in life. So this um, was the solution for us that worked really well for many years. Um, and she can, she likes to squat, so she can squat in her little squat and she can play and she can see through the shield and she can do what she needs to do with that. Um, when she was, 
It is. It's amazing. It was an idea that worked, and it's one of those things that you, you just don't think of unless you have to. And so if you are having a kiddo that is not allowing you to get anything done, if that child is not doing anything because they are so focused on injuring their own face or pulling their own hair, you can put that on, you can walk away, you can talk, and they still have access. Um, when she was in the hospital, um, they had used starfish restraints before. This is something that comes up a lot when you Google self-injury for kids. That's something that I kept seeing with starfish. So you take a, a you know, each arm and each leg are strapped to the bed. And that's what you get when you start Googling some of this. I have found that is not very effective at all. Side note, also um, quite illegal. You cannot restrain a child in a lot of states. I live currently in the state of Texas. You cannot restrain a child for any reason in the state of Texas. That was really frustrating and hard for me because I had a child that took two adults to make her stop. I mean, self injury was so pervasive for a while that it took four adult hands to keep her to stop. So there are ways that you can go through psychiatrists and things like that, and you can get prescriptions. She is, does have a prescription to wear her no-nos. I had to sign my life away to take the extra no-nos home from a surgery once because I did not have her prescription with me, and the doctors would not release her with the no-nos on because in Texas you cannot use those on a child to like for behavior purposes. You have to have a specific prescription for it. So that's something to kind of look into before you go taking your kids somewhere or strapping them down or using restraints and those kinds of words sometimes have um, legal consequences. Um, our biggest struggle with Samantha was driving. So if we're going to take her to an appointment, we want her to go to school and things like that, we don't always have someone sitting next to her. She happens to be um, kid number three or four, so I have a lot of really, really sweet siblings that help. Uh, we have extended family that helps um, really well, very supportive, but I don't always have someone with me to help with driving. So um, one of the behaviors that we saw once we got her hands taken care of so that she wasn't punching or hitting is um, swinging herself to the side. So she's too big for a regular car seat, five point harness things. Um, when we do have her in more of a traditional car seat thing, we find her wrapping things around her neck, figuring out how to pull the straps really tight because she's so big that she can kind of get around the baby type car seats. So we did find um, a positioning device. It's not a car seat. You can't just stick her in this. You still have to use a lap belt, a regular belt, but there is a car seat that kind of makes it look like um, a big, an infant car seat for a big person. And it has a seat pad in the bottom of it. And then you can position two of your shoulder belts to keep her body from being able to move. So her seat belt goes through one, and then the seat belt that's next to her goes through the other, and it kind of makes like a harness that's attached to the seat but it still meets the needs of a bigger kid that would sit in just like a booster seat instead of the, the five-point harness. Um, we use that with no-nos, and of course her siblings are always asked to help. Uh, one thing that I feel is very, very important is that people who are with her um, understand how to keep her safe. So uh, we call sometimes Sammy love or Sammy needs love. Um, that just means you better get over there and stop what's going on right now. Sammy needs some love. You know, if we're in the grocery store or at Walmart or whatever, Sammy needs some love, means you, whoever I'm talking to, go get her and stop her from what she's doing. Um, and we find it very effective to go from behind for most of her things. It's just you're less likely to get yourself injured. Not that her goal is to injure others. We don't have a whole lot of that. There are a few people that she kind of seems to be um, injurious toward, but for the most part, it's for herself. And we find it much more effective to come from the back to stop behaviors, especially ones that are um, kind of pointed toward her. So we have, you can see here, um, my sister and even her sister, when um, a couple several years ago when they were younger, coming up from behind and holding and pressing down those arms so those arms cannot get up to her face. Um, sleep, so for Samantha particularly, sleep does not stop the self-injury. So she can be completely out and punch herself really hard in the face. And so sometimes even when we're sleeping with her to try and keep herself, you'll catch a stray punch to the face and you're both sleeping and you're snoring. She's snoring. You can hear that she is completely asleep and then all of a sudden she's not. And so um, we find that we use the no-nos around the clock. So even when she's sleeping, she takes them all the time. When she's awake, we have no-no breaks. Um, you know, and as long as she has a person and she's calm and someone's holding her, she does have no-no breaks throughout the day. But at night, she sleeps with them all of the time. And um, we have found <laughs> She's really, really calming, and it calms others to sleep and put pressure. Like in between, you can see these are my um, teenage boys sleeping with her, taking naps during the day. Um, it really helps in our home to have someone take um, Sam duty for a while while I go and get things done, especially if she's frustrated or tired.
and they found this is a super effective way to really kind of calm her down and keep her safe, and they all end up passing out eventually, which is great. Um, safe beds um, are helpful. There are several different types out there. Um, my caution with the safe beds is that um, you don't have access to her when she is completely zipped up in one of the safe beds, the most safe, the safest ones, the ones that are the heavy duty um, autistic type ones that um, are kind of marketed toward this type of thing. They end up being really hard to get in and get her. So when she does figure out how to hurt herself, I feel like I don't have access to stop her without completely waking her up and changing things around. So sleeping, we're still working on that. And I'd love to hear anybody's um, suggestions. Um, with this kind of behavior, comes a lot of judgment, a lot of judgment. And sometimes that's hard, and especially for siblings, and sometimes it gets um, scary. I know we've had, um, like CPS investigations, we've had random citizens um, report that they saw my husband punch her in the face, and um, then was so angry with her that he threw her to the ground, and this great, wild, crazy claims. And it turns out what they were seeing was Samantha was hitting herself in the back of the car and he was turning around to fix her and to fix her harness and then turned around, but they, they just saw um, some of the interactions. They, they heard her being slammed against the, the door in the truck and they thought that my husband had turned around and punched her so hard that she had fallen against the car. And then that person, which good for her for being a concerned citizen, followed us to the gas station. I happened to be in the car with my husband, so I know it didn't happen. Um, but we drove to the gas station and got gas and took her to school and went and dropped her off at school. And the reports and the allegations were that he was still so mad at her that he yanked her out of the car, which Samantha likes to jump out of the car and fall to the floor. So he actually caught her from jumping out of the car and then turned around and walked her into her teacher. And um, Samantha likes to throw herself on the floor. And that's one of the ways she gets his attention. She just like buckles her knees and just falls on the floor. And so the allegations were that my husband was striking her so hard and pushing on her so hard that she was falling to the floor. My daughter also happens to be blind from self-injury. She put out, she has attached both of her retinas, lost one of her eyes. Anyways, my husband was leading her by the shoulders and it was interpreted as throwing her to the ground. So, anyways, honestly, there's no hard feelings there. They, they're hard feelings, <laughs> obviously. There's no like feelings there, but it's something that you have to be aware of. And so, you know, the words that you use and the way that you address not just her, but everyone interacting with her kind of shapes how it's seen. So, <clears throat> anyways, my suggestions um, is to be completely clear and to use lots of words consistently. So, like, everybody always asks me, especially little kids, what's wrong with her arms? What's wrong with her arms? Did she break her arms? What's on her arms? You know, and so to be able to have things that are not giving my whole life story and not trying to explain to a two-year-old that this baby has self-injury and say, oh, she uses those to keep herself safe. And those keep her arms safe and it keeps her strong and healthy. And we just say things like that um, and age appropriate. And then we are we always make sure that we share everything with caregivers. So if Sam has been pulling her hair that day, we make sure she pulled her hair that day. I woke up this morning, she had this many bruises, I'm not sure why. We see her pressing here, that's another one of her self injury behaviors, just to find that corner and to push really hard. So to say, okay, she is seeking corners, watch for corners today. To every teacher, to every aide, to every you know grandma and aunt, anyone who's keeping her at the moment, this is what we're seeing right now, I'm not sure why. Let me know if you have ideas. And it's been so helpful because people will say, oh, she did, she found two corners today and was hitting her head, and I, I didn't even, I wouldn't have noticed if I wasn't looking for that behavior. Or a lot of times she'll do it backwards instead of frontwards. Sometimes her self-injury, I'm not sure why, but it changes. And so instead of seeking for corners to hit here, all of a sudden she's going backwards. And if I don't tell her teacher, then she's not gonna notice that Samantha is using the back of her wheelchair, the back of her feeding chair, to just rub and welt um, wherever it is that they're coming back of her head. So for us, it's really imperative to really be open and honest and let people know what's going on that day, what's changing, what it's looking like, and to kind of be bossy and expect that feedback back. So, you know, the, the note in the backpack that says, great day, five stars, or, you know, she went potty and ate so many tubs of food, you know, that's not enough for me. I want to know what she's doing, when, and where, 
and that's one of the places where I feel really strongly um, that she needs a, st a big advocate um, for her and herself and her journey. Okay. And of course, we can't blame people who don't understand because no one that I know has lived with this level of self injury. And so I try to make sure that we are able to stay um, positive and know that um, we're doing what's best for Sam and hope that people are trying to encourage us or um, give suggestions and kind of keep that frame or that perspective when people do approach you with, why are you doing this? Or why is she doing that? Or have, it, have you ever thought of, and it's something really super obvious, like have you ever thought that maybe she doesn't know how to express her anger? Yeah, we have looked at that. Or maybe you think that she's, she might be experiencing pain. Do you think she's experiencing pain? Yeah, I do. I think she experiences pain every day, all day and all night. That doesn't change how I approach or what I can do um, with this child at this moment. And we, um, one other thing I want to touch on real quick is we have done lots of medicine trials over the years. And we have found some relief. And um, generally, we get relief at the start of the trial. Um, and once she kind of adjusts the medicine, the relief goes away. Sometimes it feels like she's just drowsy and kind of has the side effects or masking her ability to be self-injurious. And sometimes it honestly seems to be good. And we're thinking, oh wow, here's Samantha. And you, know, you see her, her good personality traits. But there's plenty. You know, I'm, I'm not telling you all the wonderful things about sound. There's lots of wonderful things. And those are really shiny when we start a new medicine. And it never fails six weeks in or right at that therapeutic range when all the doctors are like, this is going to be the right way. It tanks. And there's something else. We're like, oh, well, maybe now it's puberty. And maybe now there's something else. Or maybe there's something else. But it's kind of her pattern. She gets finds a medicine or a combination of medicines. You know, we've done antipsychotics, we've done um, straight up antidepressants, we've done she's been seizure medications, all these kinds of things, and a lot of them have sedative qualities, and almost all of them do. And once we get past that initial drowsy state and we get to the therapeutic range with her, it all kind of falls off and we see the emergence of a new different kind of self injury or something different happens with her self injury. So um, that was another thing that I wanted to mention, but it does help. Overall, it does help. So she's not in a place now where she has to have two adults. Obviously, she's sitting in her wheelchair over there by herself. She's happy, she's calm, um, she's not injuring herself. We are able to just mitigate with no-nos at the time. If you took those no-nos off right now, you would see um, non-stop self-injury. But she is, at the moment, able to regulate that with a little bit of help. from a parent um, about a specific behavior of falling to the ground and um, kind of attacking and, and making the, the injurious behavior toward another person and it concerns with school because school uses like the starfish or the four-point restraint um, and leaves them there for a while and how to address that. I know um, in our state that is not legal. Um, they won't even do small like restraints like what Sam has on now in school without psychiatrist approval and on file um, prescriptions. Um, so that it does definitely gives me pause for sure. Yeah, um, they do it in New Jersey. 
mean, I've been in prison. I'm being tied with my four plus insurance and a house that's been broken for worse. It's horrendous. We've had, we've had Samantha's room too. That was another one that was mentioned on the floor. The little gym mats that go up on the floor. So Samantha's bedroom definitely has those, those over the years. There were times when she has to have the, the pads there just because there's holes in drywall and things from where she's hitting. Um, but in school, generally, it is my experience when there are behaviors like that instead of the restraint, if you work on your IEP and decide when you need more than one-on-one. -on -one. So for Samantha, for her IEP, she has one-on-one -on -one all day long. And then, so for transitions, she has two-on-one. -on -one. And for, I think it was fourth or fifth grade year, uh, for anything that she had to do that um, diaper changes, feeding times, and not all transitions, but if she was leaving the school building, like going outside for recess, she had three on one. And so um, it depends on your state and what they allow. But for us and for Samantha, she had to have extra people because she would hurt herself. So she had one person either pushing the wheelchair, one person holding her hands down, and then some person explaining the task. So once self-injury becomes at a certain level, it kind of takes over everything else. And so if you want her to look at a book or you want her to push a down button to say yes or no, you have to have her attention and she can't be pulling herself and she can't be hitting herself. So sometimes it takes one person to hold the button and one person to stop the self-injury. And so in those kind of situations, we found our IEP was better served by having more people there. You know, and whether or not it's fair to have three people just to take Samantha to recess, that's a whole other can of worms. <laughs> but that is something that in our school district, it was, that was how we approached it and we're able to make it safe for her and still be functional in school. So she's not just there being restrained all day. Because I mean, I love her going to school and me being able to get things done, but like you, I'm not okay with them saying, oh, I don't know what to do with her. We're just gonna restrain her and put her somewhere else where she can't move. I was just gonna ask them just because they just called me and I'll come back. I actually did that one year too. She's saying that she called, she would rather call and come to school. your school district but they definitely they do have resources available and if your kid needs more than one person to be safe and to be educated okay. in America public okay. education is available to all. Awesome. So um, a huge thank you to our panelists and if we could give them all a round of applause.